Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome to everyone on uh, screen on their screens at home. Um, I hope you're healthy and you stay healthy. A very warm welcome to our guests tonight, to tonight's uh, webinar. It's called Slamming the EU, the Corona Crisis and Disinformation in Central Europe. Before we start with the actual um, webinar, uh, we would like to give you some technical um, advice so you know how the procedure will be and how you can interact and how you can raise questions. Um, you will see on your screen that there is um, a virtual hand. And if you would like to raise a question, um, you can do it orally and you can raise this hand. We will see this, we will note this and we will then call you up. Uh, you will be unmuted and you will have the chance to speak to all the participants and to the audience. The second option is a written question. Uh, you just write uh, in this chat your question. I ask you maybe not for too long questions because it sometimes takes a lot of time to, um, to read out those questions, be short, brief and precise. This is um, a very big help for all of us. So now we come to the actual um, content. Um, while in an open society, politicians try to inform their citizens as best as they can. And we saw, uh, at least in many countries, the support for independent public media increases a lot. To find solution, uh, we as decision makers should rely on facts and scientific research as much as we can. But in a more authoritarian and less open society, the head of states try to use this crisis for their own agenda. And we will listen to how this is being practiced um, during the last weeks uh, from our guests tonight. In this respect, in the countries of which we are talking tonight, uh, it is very obvious. Uh, in the case of Hungary, uh, it is the blaming of the technocrats in Brussels. It's, as always, Sor uh, George Soros. And, of course, it is the migrants. They are all very similar subjects in the other countries, and we will hear this. We see in all our countries different conspiracy theories, but especially the anti-EU slamming is used in some countries, and we would like to hear a little bit more why is it like this. Interesting enough is, at least from my perspective, that these are mainly states which disproportionately benefit from the corona crisis assistance or the EU funds. So how could this happen? Uh, this is what will be explained tonight by our three distinguished speakers, by our guest. And I would like to start with uh, Peter Krakow. I guess many of you uh, will know him. Um, he is a distinguished speaker. He is a well-known scholar. He's the director of the Political Capital um, Institute from Budapest. And he's not just known in Hungary, um, but he's also known in many other uh, places and has worked extensively on radicalization, on extremism, but also on disinformation. The second speaker for tonight, and uh, I'm, I'm very glad that she has agreed, uh, is from Poland, Agata Szeszniak. She's an author, she's a redactor and a publisher from Warsaw. Her platform, Oko Press, is very well known and is, has a high reach out for more than 3 million clicks per month. It's an online platform and she uh, does and delivers exactly this information, what people are looking for. We as decision makers, but also, of course, ordinary citizen people, uh, constituents in this, um, in this situation, not only because of the crisis, but also um, in the crisis. And she is very active on social media. And when it comes to social media, I'm especially glad that my colleague, Mikolas uh, Pekša, from the Czech Republic and from the Pirate Party has agreed to our invitation tonight. That's, uh, of course, his home turf. He is, as a pirate, especially active on uh, social media, but not there, of course. He is a real, very good and valid colleague, uh, colleague in the parliament. And um, 
he will tell us about his, uh, let's say, a specific work during the crisis weeks. Uh, what does it mean for a, a Czech MEP and a former MP from the national parliament and how he does and tries to counterbalance with state propaganda and this, let's say, typical narrative he's faced by, um, by different media representatives. So we would like to start with Peter Krakow. Uh, each of you will have the opportunity to give us an input of eight to maximum 10 minutes, but all the participants already um, um, asked and requested to send your questions or to raise your hands. We will all collect them. And either we do a second round or if there are enough questions, we start immediately with the Q&A. So Peter, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Viola and and uh, uh, it's a real honor to be on this panel. Thank you very much for organizing it. and thank you for all your work you do on countering disinformation uh, in in Europe. I think the resolution that you and your colleagues initiated on pushing back Russian and Chinese disinformation around the coronavirus was something uh, crucial and very important. And I think it should. Uh, I think um, much more EU citizens should be aware of the fact that these countries, that you know, a lot of countries pose as the big allies of the European Union, when the otherwise are spreading uh, deadly dangerous disinformation, undermining the trust in the uh, institutions within the European Union, spreading anti-vaccination messages and so on. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the problem uh, is increasingly within the European Union as well, is that we not only have this authoritarian regime spreading disinformation uh, in democratic countries, the traditional framework we know well, and, and this is the traditional framework that the institutional settings, either within the United States or within the European uh, Union, the EU versus this info team can deal with. If, if this information is external, then it just becomes a question of how to defend it from the democratic states. But what we can observe in um, some EU member states, and I think Hungary is probably the most important uh, example in this regard, is um, state-sponsored information uh, within um, an officially democratic uh, country, within the uh, club uh, of the most developed democracies in the world, the European Union. Uh, in Hungary, just to give a bit of contextualization, uh, there we can find the most centralized media environment within the European Union with more with practically 500 media outlets belonging to one national foundation uh, that is an umbrella for for the media outlets and uh, in a in a quite strong agreement with each other in the strike uh, in a strong QR. They are pushing through centralized messages and in a lot of cases disinformation and even fake news about what is going on in the European Union, what is going on in the Western world. And um, what, what we can see in the last period is that uh, the disinformation uh, environment had become much more vivid in the whole European Union and, and the government became uh, more in, more. Uh, more active in spreading this information as well, uh, both online and, and offline. Um, the, the, the starting point of my talk about coronavirus would be that um, Hungary is not probably not the only country that was uh, that that uh, met with the coronavirus rather unprepared, but in what is a special case in Hungary, is that one of the main concerns of the public opinion is the bad uh, situation in the healthcare sector. So uh, against the governmental will, the most important concern of the Hungarians these days, uh, or even before the corona hit the country, according to Eurobarometer poll, was not migration, was not terrorism, the favorite topics of the government that they like to talk about, but the, the uh, state of the healthcare sector. And 42% of the Hungarians mentioned it among the, uh, most important problems uh, regarding Hungary. So this is one thing why the government uh, at the beginning was not really happy about uh, talking about the coronavirus. The second thing was that they uh, launched uh, some governmental campaigns against the Roma in Hungary, uh, against the judiciary, 
uh, and also in, in the migration issues. So they wanted to have a big symbolic campaign against some minorities and enemies of the state. And then the coronavirus hit the country. Uh, the first reaction of the prime minister was that it's not even a big thing. So he, at the beginning of February, he told that less coronavirus is something bad, but for Hungarians, migration is the big threat. And he was pointing on, on uh, the, the collapse of the EU-Turkey deal as, as, as the big problem that, that will approach uh, Hungary. Uh, then in the next phase, when this denial uh, had to be over, and the first cases in Hungary, uh, first coronavirus uh, cases in Hungary were detected in early March, then his narrative was that, um, first of all, this is caused by illegal migration. Like, uh, like a virus that first rather hit the elites uh, in the Western world, including, for example, the British prime minister, famous actors, politicians, and so on, as, as if they had quite regular contacts with, with uh, illegal uh, migrants. So th this was the narrative that uh, migrant countries have big problems of the coronavirus. Let's take a look at Western Europe, where uh, there is a huge problem of coronavirus because of migration. And the other thing was that the first, uh, first patients who were detected were Iranian students. And these Iranian students are mentioned practically in every governmental uh, statement and even at the operative body uh, of the of the government that is a, uh, responsible for uh, fighting the uh, coronavirus they mention it every time that the, that the, these were the Iranian students that were first detected they were expelled from Hungary in a very spectacular manner uh, under at, let's say at least questionable charges according to Helsinki committee in Hungary uh, but um, it, it really seems like the government wanted to find a scapegoat and the Muslims were the scapegoat to, to, uh, to associate with the uh, coronavirus. So it was the first round of state-sponsored disinformation in Hungary coming through all the media outlets in a highly centralized manner, plus in paid advertisements. So when other governments were rather busy uh, sending the message that wash your hand, the Hungarian government was rather busy at the first round to send the message that these were Iranians who brought here the, the virus. Then uh, Orban could feel the opportunity that, that uh, this virus is not uh, only something that, that the government has to deal with on a policy level. And let's say the political responses were much more, uh, much more convincing from the very beginning than the policy responses, but he, he still an opportunity first to centralize further his power, second to strengthen the economic interest and and the enabling act that was passed in 30 of March should be understood in this context. But the enabling act is not the only problematic aspect of what uh, is uh, what is happening in Hungary these days uh, in in terms of of legal procedures because some of the most controversial laws are pushed through the parliament these days. So it's not like the parliament has been sus suspended. There is just one more tool in the already huge toolkit of the Hungarian government to, to achieve its political and, and uh, economic goals. But going back to, to this information, what happened after this, this uh, first, um, first period? Uh, a big, uh, the, there has been criticism, an increasing criticism coming from the European Union, especially because of this uh, state of danger law. And the reaction of the government was, was threefold. Three messages were sent to the Hungarian public. First of all, the, gover the EU gives, doesn't give a penny to the Hungarian state, which is factually totally incorrect, but was pushed through even in the official bulletin of the Hungarian regulations, the government published that the, uh, that the European Union gives zero money for uh, dealing with the coronavirus. On the other hand, uh, EU is just criticizing Hungary, so they do not help. They, they just uh, push us uh, further in, into the problem. And the third thing was that Hungary is totally, uh, the European Union was totally unprepared and they have not prepared the member states at all for, for the situation, which is again, factually incorrect given the European Commission's warnings and, and questions to the, to the member states. And, and the fourth narrative, uh, which is also a, very strong disinformation narrative fitting into the general framework of what the government likes to communicate about is that we don't have our friends in the Western world these days. Our only friends are China, Turkmenistan, 
Azerbaijan, Turkey, and, um, and Uzbekistan. They were the ones who helped us when we were in need. China with, with uh, providing a lot of masks and equipment, of course, for an awful lot of money and uh, in a very low quality, still is, it is not mentioned and we received some donations from the members of the Turkey Council. So the already existing narrative in Hungary that it is, we only have our friends on the East and almost no one uh, in the West, it, it is becoming um, even stronger and stronger and the government, and it adds into the strong uh, disinformation uh, warfare of authoritarian states, Russia and China, that are that the main rationale of which is to destroy the image of the West. And that's why I think uh, Hungary, the Hungarian case is not only a, a Hungarian domestic case. First of all, Orban is a role model for many politicians in the European Union. Second, um, he destroys the image of the European Union, and not just in Hungary, but he they de does it in the international press as well. And and the third thing is that the rule of law is in a serious danger in Hungary. There are right now military units going to companies, uh, even Western companies in Hungary, and there was already a takeover of a Hungarian company by the government by decree. So even uh, the EU, other EU member states should care because the investments in Hungary should be in danger as well. If the rule of law uh, is in a huge danger, then when the government has to muddle through a very serious economic crisis, then uh, I think a lot of unorthodox measures going against Western economic interests uh, can be on the table. Thanks a lot, Peter. That was a very impressive and very comprehensive uh, first uh, input uh, to our discussion. I think it is important to note that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the European Centre for Crisis and Prevention was uh, sending out a request to all the member states whether they are prepared at the end of January, I think it was the 24th of January, a request uh, to ask each and every member state whether they are prepared for the upcoming pandemic. And you can guess what they have answered, 26 and 27 of them. They have said, yes, we have all the masks, uh, we have all the medical equipment, we have all the protective uh, equipment. So there's nothing you, you as the EU have to worry about. Yeah? And now blaming the EU for not having done anything. Second point is also important that while the corona funds, I've, I've said that before, are now uh, being distributed for the, let's say, old um, uh, Berliner Schlüssel, the old uh, criteria, Hungary has uh, benefited the most. So per capita, Hungary has received the biggest amount, the biggest share of, of this assistance, while the solidarity with other countries, <laughs> uh, let's say, relatively small. Yeah. So I guess we have, we in the European Union have a big problem with our communication uh, strategy. There is a big lack of communication from Brussels to the citizens, to the constituents, to the people. And maybe, Agata, you could... Um, connect on this and pick up uh, how the situation in Poland is and what do you do with the OCO press uh, platform to inform the people about facts, about the truth, about the um, situation in the pandemic and also what the European Union's contribution is uh, uh, towards Poland. And uh, so maybe explain a little bit more in detail how the situation looks like. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for this opportunity to talk to the European audience and uh, thank you for an invitation. Uh, I believe that this day's exchange of information and ideas across the Europe borders uh, is even more important than even before. And uh, as you mentioned, I'm a journalist from Poland. Uh, I work for OcoPress, which is online medium launched in 2016. Uh, and as also you mentioned, uh, we are very happy to have almost 3 million readers uh, monthly. Uh, and it started uh, during this pandemic when we uh, gained even more, more readers than before. Uh, as we believe that uh, we are one of the trusted 
media outlets in Poland. Uh, we publish fact-checking, we publish uh, reports, uh, we publish uh, in-deep analysis of, of what's going on in Poland uh, at the moment and uh, before. And uh, I also would like to underline that Okopress is uh, an independent media outlet, so we are financed by voluntary donations by our readers. We are no, not financed by any party or uh, by advertisements. Uh, and we are very happy that this month we were awarded uh, with Freedom of Expression Award by Index on Censorship uh, for the work we do um, in this field of uh, freedom of expression. Uh, so, I would like to start by looking at the situation in Poland in terms of epidemic. Uh, as of yesterday, we had, unfortunately, uh, 10,000 registered infections, more than 400 people died, which makes 4% of all cases. And the problem is that we have one of the lowest number of people tested per million citizens in Europe, which places Poland uh, in the 23rd place in Europe, according to the number of tests. Uh, this is the problem with, because uh, public opinion don't know the real scale of pandemic. And uh, if we talk about disinformation during the time times of pandemic, I think this is uh, uh, this is the point to stress that uh, people in many countries don't know don't, don't know the real scale of this crisis. In Poland, as in other countries, people are close at homes uh, are struggling. Uh, we don't know the number of recent of unemployed uh, yet. Uh, no, this Monday, uh, the first set of restrictions were lifted. Now we can go to park or to the forest, but we need to wear masks. And shopping malls uh, are still closed and schools and universities work online. So, going to, uh, to the politics. As probably you know, Law and Justice Party won parliamentary elections in Poland in October uh, 2019 for the second time. Uh, but did you know that this time two million more people voted for Kaczynski's party? And uh, in the middle of February, uh, Law and Justice Party was supported by 41% of respondents, according to Kantar Public. Mm. And 40% uh, of people declared they uh, would vote for Andrzej Duda. Uh, in presidential elections. And uh, if we talk about uh, politics during the, during the pandemic, uh, the pandemic in Poland uh, erupted at the beginning of the presidential campaign. And actually, election is the main political topic in Poland these days. Uh, it is planned to take place on the 10th of May, and uh, Jarosław Kaczyński is determined to organize the presidential elections uh, at all costs. Law and Justice uh, Party submitted a special bill regulating the organization of the presidential elections in May. And according to this bill, we'll have postal election. Uh, and uh, According to many institutions, like Helsinki Foundation for Human Rights or the Polish Ombudsman, uh, regulations that are being introduced constitute a fundamental threat to the honesty and uh, fairness of these elections. And, uh, uh, and for example, recently the National Electoral Commission was deprived of its powers. It can no longer print the voting cards. This is uh, and, uh, what is National uh, Electoral Commission. It, this is institution which was responsible for organizing elections in Poland uh, for 30 years. Uh, but on the 17th of uh, April, uh, President Andrzej Duda signed a bill depriving uh, this commission the powers uh, to organize elections. Uh, the new laws are not consulted uh, neither with opposition parties nor with social partners. Uh, very often there are uh, 
signed uh, during the night. Uh, another problem is that uh, we uh, we are not sure uh, when these elections will take part. Uh, the date uh, supposed is uh, 10th of May, but maybe it will be 17th or 23rd of May. Uh, there is a huge conflict uh, around these elections in Poland these days. Uh, I'm going to EU and disinformation. Uh, this issue is a tricky one. Uh, probably not that uh, not that clear as uh, in Hungary. Uh, I will give two examples. On March uh, 18, Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki and Andrzej Duda, both of them had press conference. And uh, Polish President uh, Andrzej Duda said that Poland is coping with crisis completely alone, with no help from the European Union. Uh, on the other hand, Prime Minister said that EU has spent no single euro on helping countries in crisis. No single euro. Uh, in Oko Press, uh, our interpretation of these words was that both Prime Minister and President are going to alienate Poland from EU that they are building untrust towards EU. Uh, however, uh, a few weeks later, the narrative had changed. Speaking in front of the Polish parliament, Prime Minister said that EU accepted some measures proposed by the, the Polish government and that Poland is one of the main forces shaping the European response to the crisis. Uh, we, uh, we in Okopres believe that this main point that Polish government uh, uh, knows that uh, it can no longer cope with the crisis uh, without European support, that the scale is too large uh, to Poland to cope with, with it alone. Uh, but prob probably Polish authorities uh, know the same polls as we know. Uh, and according to the polls published recently, from 75 to 80 percent of Pol uh, po Polish citizens uh, express uh, positive emotion, emotions towards uh, European Union, uh, and two thirds support, support further integration of European Union. Uh, this is the poll from the last week. Uh, Unfortunately, at the same time, we can observe the ongoing campaign against EU in the state-owned media. Uh, and also state-owned media, like in recent years, are still spreading the fear against immigrants. Uh, I was also uh, asked to mention some, uh, uh, some issues where, where we can uh, expect uh, something from Europe, what uh, Europe needs to do. So, firstly, uh, don't stop following countries like Poland or Hungary. Secondly, uh, elections in Poland. This is uh, the issue of great importance now, uh, and we really need Europe to follow it carefully. Uh, thirdly, I would say that uh, we expect Europe to set st some standards. I mean, standards of leadership and communications. Uh, uh, we in Poland uh, uh, have a group of Polish intellectuals uh, who have prepared the letter titled Europe, a patient. Uh, this letter uh, states that we need uh, economic solidarity to save the community from coronavirus. Uh, and they write that the solutions adapted to combat uh, will determine the future of uh, the European integration uh, and I think it's uh, extremely important for Europe to show this uh, solidarity with countries like Poland or Hungary uh, and uh, also I would like to say that uh, NGOs and media are of fundamental importance these day, days uh, uh, and also in coming months and in Poland, uh, many NGOs hire people on short-term contracts. Uh, they are the first to suffer from crisis. And we also know that uh, crisis uh, touches media. Uh, I personally know people who are going to be hired, uh, fired from uh, media these days. And uh, uh, if I am asked what uh, I expect for Euro from Europe, I also 
uh, would recommend uh, some funds to support uh, independent uh, media uh, which uh, provide uh, trusted information. Okay, and I think for now it would be. Thanks a lot. Wow, there was substantial input uh, from Poland, definitely. And it was very interesting to see this, uh, let's say, the ambivalent uh, within the Polish leadership. And, and that would be my, my, my point to refer now to the Czech Republic, while I know that uh, the Czech opinion, public opinion, uh, is not as positive as obviously the Polish public opinion, while it is more or it's easier, uh, I guess, for your prime minister to blame the EU. When we have heard uh, Agata has, has named uh, 75 to 80 percent has more or less a positive impression or public opinion mm -hmm. um, uh, towards the EU, this is a, a pretty impressive number. I know from the Czech Republic that looks differently. And that's, I guess, would be also one reason to explain why um, uh, Mr. Uh, Babish uh, doesn't have to have, let's say, um, this discrepancy, but he can just go on one track as he has done before. I mean, maybe you can explain a little bit more in detail how the situation looks like and what is his strategy and how he fight or doesn't fight the pandemic and how he informs uh, his his public opinion or the public in general. Yes, Gladlian. first of all, thank you very much for organizing this meeting. Uh, it's really, really uh, super useful also for me to hear experience from the colleagues uh, from, from uh, the other countries. Uh, as you mentioned, like the support for EU within Czech Republic is lower than in Poland. It's, uh, I think something like 50%, which is comparable or disadvantage. On the other hand, the prime minister is controlling only roughly like 30% uh, of the media market, which is uh, considerably better than uh, comparing to the situation in uh, Hungary. Uh, I, would, I would maybe start from the from what happened in the middle of March, because uh, recently we, are, we were informed by EU Stratcom that EU is target of uh, campaign organized by Russia and China in order to really like use this uh, pandemic to undermine trust in the EU. And I, to be honest, I was not really surprised because what we have seen in the middle of March was a stunning wave of propaganda, which was hardly comparable to anything we have seen before. Me, from my personal experience, I, I can compare it only with what happened after the annexation of Crimea and during the migration crisis. But it's one of the one of the biggest peaks of activity, and I was really really uh, scared at the beginning because there were people coming uh, saying uh, even like mm, you know I am European uh, federalist, but still uh, what shall I say? There is EU is doing nothing, and uh, they just did everything wrong. At that point, it was really like surprising that. Uh, there is really a lack of any communication on what the EU did. I, and uh, now I, at this point, I have to uh, little bit explain our position. Pirates are the opposition. We are not uh, voting for the confidence, neither for the national government, nor for the uh, EU commission. So we are honestly expected more to, let's say, criticize what is being done rather than support the positions. But uh, at that point, I was really uh, like, hey, I really need to find what the EU does and really proactively communicate what the European Commission had done in order to explain to the citizens that there is a reason to stay in the EU because at that point there was effectively nothing. So I had really to, to go with my team uh, to, uh, let's say, foreign media and show some examples of uh, cooperation between France and Germany or Germany and Italy and so on because nothing like that was really reported in the Czech media and I was surprised. The social media at that time, it was really like swamp, uh, filled with, I would say, far right propaganda uh, going against the EU. What I have to admit was kind of like uh, surprising that uh, the, the, uh, a part of lack of communication from the European Commission, there were other sources. Like there are some uh, me media communicating uh, positions of Hungarian government. Effectively, what Peter uh, previously mentioned was uh, seen uh, 
even in the Czech trace book, uh, pro uh, propagated. I don't know who paid the, the advertisements, but uh, I guess uh, the Hungarian government is very much interested in uh, what's going on, even in uh, Czech Republic. Just to just to uh, connect it, like uh, the Czech Prime Minister, he owns quite a big company, which has also a branch in Hungary. So they are kind of like cooperating uh, between Czechia and Hungary together. So we have seen really this, this astonishing uh, amount of propaganda going against the EU, and we had to really build build up uh, the EU communication because there was absolute lack of uh, anything done uh, by the Commission, nor by Council or any other other EU body. Now it's uh, becoming a little bit better, but uh, because some local NGOs started uh, proactively like communicating what the EU does. Uh, however, we we really need to work on that because uh, obviously uh, the the current approach, which is being uh, used in order to uh, tackle the disinformation warfare, is not really effective. The EU required Facebook and other social uh, media uh, platforms to, let's say, restrict the disinformation. On the other hand, did not provide it really the, the own information. Like, for example, what you have mentioned, Viola, at the beginning about the uh, about the uh, warning in January. Yeah, it happened, but no one really communicated to the broad public that this information was available. And I can I can absolutely confirm uh, what you have mentioned. We had a parliament discussion. Uh, the, the opposition was really requesting the government to provide information about the preparedness for the uh, for the uh, crisis, and effectively the government uh, did everything to silence it. Uh, I just have to just just have to reiterate uh, the mention that was here about the Chinese support. This is kind of like more general pattern because what you have seen in the Hungary. Uh, like the government is really like appreciating the Chinese support we have seen in Czechia as well. Uh, all the governmental officials, like the most important ministers plus the prime minister, they were all like uh, celebrating and welcoming the first plane providing the masks coming from China. Uh, the, the ironically, like uh, those masks were bought, not uh, like give, uh, given, it was just like a trade. But still, they they give a huge PR in order to support it. I was really like surprised that they uh, took that positions because it was even more uh, submissive comparing what from what we have seen in before. I've seen no really like coordinated uh, EU uh, uh, attempt to really provide an alternative narrative. We are just trying to block those narratives. But the local media are full of that, and uh, I think we should really uh, we should really have a discussion on that issue uh, within the European Parliament because uh, when I see fifty thousand of reactions on uh, the let's say foreign campaigns and just five uh, reactions on the the account of the European Commission, there is obviously something wrong. I agree, I agree completely, and I do suffer a lot. I mean, we have set up, uh, you have mentioned it, the EU Stratcom. Uh, this is a team, I think, of 13 uh, experts, former interpreters for the Danish Krone, and so many people who know their, um, the, the topic of disinformation, how it works, but it's much too small. And before I read out the first question and give the first um, <clears throat> uh, oral question uh, to, the, to the speakers, um, this would be maybe also my, my first uh, question maybe to Peter. Um, what would be your advice? I mean, Stratcom is small and it's in English and it, I guess it will be read out by people like me and others who are interested in the subject anyway. I mean, uh, uh, Mikolaj was um, um, mentioning and, and pointing out that this lack of information costs us a lot in, in terms of reputation, in terms of credibility. Why isn't the European Union uh, taking up on this? And, and I guess Mikolaj is right. We have to raise this topic uh, in in an even broader sense in the European Parliament. And I know that people will be interested in this. <clears throat> and I know the majority of our colleagues is as concerned as we. 
But nevertheless, Commission is very reluctant in the European External Action Service as well to uh, stuff this, to equip this uh, with more um, experts and a, and a bigger team. I don't know what's your impression. I mean, you're working on this subject already for five years since the Ukraine uh, occupation uh, started. Will you shortly comment on this? Yeah, I think it's it's a really substantial question, and I, I have a good opinion, a high opinion on on the EU versus disinfo team. I know a lot of good colleagues there, and I think they really have good intention and a lot of them um, good expertise as well. On the other hand, I think you're totally right that it's understaffed and underfinanced. So these are the two first uh, issues that should be solved. And behind all that is unfortunately the reluctance of some member states to go more deeply into that topic. So uh, because some member states would like to have more friendly relationship with Russia and not pointing on the disinformation as, as a quite unfriendly uh, gesture towards uh, EU member states. So more money, more stuff. And I think uh, the second issue what should be done is that uh, if the EU versus disinfo is only uh, focusing on disinformation coming from outside, I think it partially ignores the elephant in the room. So in Hungary, the big problem is not direct disinformation coming from Russia, China, because, I mean, Russia today, for example, wanted to come to Hungary. Finally, they abandoned the idea. Why? Because they feel they don't have to. Uh, I mean, the governmental, pro-governmental media, the government organized media is doing it for free uh, high, very extensively. So you should also focus on disinformation in the member states from domestic sources. And of course, it's a much more tricky thing because then you have to go into domestic politics. But, uh, but the most dangerous narratives are not necessarily coming from Russia and China. These are coming from European populists. So the threat is at least as much internal as external. And, and uh, without recognizing it, without systemically analyzing it, I think, yeah, we, we really ignore the elephant uh, in the uh, in the room and the third thing, but I think it's connected to the to the uh, to the stuff, the small stuff that you versus disinfo has, is that I think in every country they should at least have two national media partners to bring their analysis to the domestic audience. But even with this low level of financing and and uh, and low level of stuff, they are already I think rather successful at least in Hungary in bringing some of their analysis into the national public so their topics are interesting for the for the for the european audience so i think with more efforts with more money and with with yeah with a more extensive focus they can do much more perfect thanks peter i would give uh, the first uh, oral question and uh, therefore Axel uh, should be unmuted and you should also unmute yourself. So on the screen, you probably see a little microphone and we will unmute you and you will parallel unmute yourself and then please give us a sign and then you uh, raise your question to everyone. I hope we can see you and you are still, you are still present. Does it work? Uh, yes, I, yeah. I, I okay, am present. Perfect. Okay. I don't see the question though. Um, so concerning this question of uh, disinformation from local sources rather than uh, Russia and China, I, I would tend to agree with uh, what uh, Peter Kretko just uh, said. And I think a lot of all this uh, rhetoric has more to do with internal uh, political struggles inside the different uh, EU member states. Uh, I think also part of the negative reaction uh, towards the EU current for the current uh, pandemic uh, crisis was tied to the fact that the EU helped to the first countries who were affected were actually late and not sufficient, in particular the situation uh, in Italy was very problematic. It's still the EU country with the highest level of victims from the pandemic and with the most serious uh, problem in the management of the crisis. And the EU was not uh, providing at all uh, aid to the Italian authorities at the start and then 
very late and not sufficiently. So um, this kind of, I'm myself from Belgium, but I lived for uh, quite a few years in Italy and be it in my own country or in Italy, which are two countries which are very much in favor of the European Union in general, and the majority of the population is very much in favor of a stronger EU integration. The, the crisis management at EU level was perceived as something very problematic and breaking down uh, the EU unity, the EU collaboration. So I, I don't know what you have to answer about that in different countries, but uh, from a more Western European rather than Central European, uh, that, that would be the concern. Thanks a lot for your question. I mean, your question is <clears throat> absolutely right. And um, I see there is not a visible uh, support. But as I said, I mean, first of all, before I hand over to Mikolas, who could also uh, answer to the question, let me also say that uh, the competence for crisis management, for health management, for health care is traditionally not on the European Union level. And all the member states have refused to give this competence to the European Union's level. So it is up to the national states to take care of this and uh, to do the prevention stuff, to do the medical and uh, the healthcare. And of course, now in the crisis situation, everyone recognized there was a mistake. Yeah, But as I said, at the end of January, the request by the European Union was very positively uh, replied and so it is a bit difficult now of course with the Italian case you're absolutely right and there was a big mistake that was late but nevertheless uh, I guess it was hard for the European Union to provide things where they are not um, um, what is they are not in their competence. Mikolas would you maybe um, answer some more sentence or some more explain why the European Union has reacted uh, so delayed? Well, uh, yeah, I just can absolutely confirm what you have previously mentioned. The EU was uh, not uh, originally intended to, let's say, have a reserve of uh, ventilators or uh, protective masks or whatsoever. Like, no one was considering the the aspect that would something happen in the EU, uh, we uh, should have such a reserve to, to provide the state that is actually affected. So, uh, yeah, at the very beginning, uh, any support for Italy, uh, which should happen, was supposed to, uh, to happen from the, the other member states. So, uh, we were really awaiting when Germany will decide to, to send something there and so on. Uh, but this, this, this is one part. The other part is actually there was a lot of other uh, other support provided to Italy from the EU, but the one which is mostly discussed is the support from Russia. It's number times smaller than than the US, but they just do quite a good PR. And maybe I'm a little bit repeating myself, but going back uh, to the disinformation, we kind of like learned how to identify them and say, yeah, this is a disinformation. But we uh, have not learned to deliver this message to our citizens. So they still kind of like uh, live uh, being affected by the disinformation. And uh, this is this is the, really the problem. I, I think it's just uh, for me and you, Viola, to something which should be raised within our budgetary control committee. We should ask for really a performance what is the let's say performance on uh, communicating this? What is the outreach of our messages of the information? What we are doing? What the EU does? Uh, what is uh, let's say uh, our like uh, respective information about the hoax is being spread to the citizens? And this is kind of not being done, and really should change. Absolutely. The efficiency of our assistance needs to be evaluated and this is up to us to control this. Absolutely. So I read out the first written question by Sean. To what extent has coronavirus crisis simply accelerated existing illiberal trends and populist mis misinformation in your countries? And to what extent has it triggered something new or changed politics? 
Agata, would you like to start? Is it just a, a trend or has it really changed or could it have changed uh, okay. politics? What's, what's your uh, guess on this? It is, of course, a uh, question of great importance and uh, like this is ongoing situation. So uh, we are observing what changes and in what direction. But uh, as I mentioned, uh, our government uh, used this situation to introduce uh, some laws, like, for example, this election law. And they completely changed uh, 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 how we organize elections in Poland. Uh, because uh, we, of course, we were going and voting by uh, in in traditional personal voting and now they are going to introduce this uh, postal voting but uh, it is completely unprepared and probably the law will be signed by president uh, uh, in 6th on or 7th of the may and uh, the date as i said uh, is the 10th of may so we have only three days to prepare to, to elections uh, and uh, of course they do uh, what like this government is doing what they've done before uh, proposing the law without consultation proposing the uh, it uh, during the night uh, so this is like business as usual but even more in this situation uh, they also gave some uh, um, additional uh how to say that uh, like they, they ex extended what uh, police can do during this crisis uh and uh, and some people some experts claim that uh, the the laws uh, introduced by uh, the government uh, are unconstitutional uh that they violate constitution i would say as uh, this government uh, was doing in the last five years uh what is new uh, you know in in poland uh, in those five years uh, we had eruption of uh, protests eruption of uh, uh, civil society of uh, different forms of uh, public engagement of citizens and uh, now um, like i um, i fear that maybe uh, people stay at home like people cannot protest when they introduce this law uh, violating constitution this new law uh, on elections people cannot go to the streets uh, and uh, a few days ago, uh, we had uh, discussion in Parliament uh, because uh, some four bills uh, uh, were uh, were debated in Parliament. This, one of them uh, was very restrictive bill uh, going to forbid abortion in Poland completely. And uh, we observed uh, very new forms of protests. Uh, for example, protests in cars. Women, but not on, only women, uh, came to the street in cars. They were having flags uh, uh, in cars or some uh, like women were uh, putting posters uh, uh, in windows, uh, girls were uh, placing photographs, selfies uh, in social media with the sign of this protest, uh, which was uh, something draw on uh, like here or or on uh, on hands. Uh, so, uh, civil society is testing new forms of. Uh, protests now in Poland, but also government, uh, I think, is testing uh, new forms of uh, introducing some kinds of uh, authoritarian laws or not that democratic laws. Mm. Uh, now, I, I cannot say that, that this is going in this or that 
direction, but the, for sure uh, this government is trying to gain even more power it uh, had before. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, here is another question on Hungary and maybe Peter could also uh, um, um, reply to the first question. While I thought, for example, that the power of Mr. Orban could crumble a little bit when I've heard that, for example, he was against to close the schools. Yeah, But uh, the state propaganda was still and the state media was still on uh, on, on, on blaming uh, how can you uh, close the schools while he has uh, while he gave already his press conference to announce this so this contradictory uh, messages I really hope that people finally discover what a mess this government is and how I mean how actually weak in this crisis situation he rules this country but nevertheless I don't know what you think whether this is uh, up uh, the, the trend uh, of this elaborate um, uh, uh, policies is being strengthened. I mean, we have seen the emergency uh, uh, law and other things. Um, maybe you could uh, comment on this. And there's another question um, by Frank Dieter. He asks you, can you say something about the public opinion in Hungary on the European Union today? This would be up to you, Peter, to reply yeah. to this. Thank you very much. Very, very good. Uh, Questions and 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 the important to the point topics. I mean, just just uh, um, just to support what has been already uh, said on on Poland. I think we we in Hungary see more of the same thing than before. So similarly, um, feeling much more that they can do it without too much public scrutiny in these days. I mean, when, when people are afraid of, of um, dying, then they do not care that much about governmental transparency. They do not uh, care that much about human rights. They do not care that much about centralization of power. Uh, and even more, there is a general tendency uh, to support the ones in power in those kind of troubled times. Uh, we just made a made a, a review based on the political poll of polls research on on the popularity of of the governmental parties within the European Union. What we found is that, with the exception of two countries, Romania and Slovenia, where there was a slight decline in the popularity of the government in all the other countries mm -hmm. the uh, governmental parties have gained popularity and in this let's say 25 member states there are some who treated the crisis well there are some who treated the crisis really bad still the government supports them uh, the public opinion supports them but i think it will be a temporary thing so this rally around the flag effect i think will disappear when when the governments have to deal with the consequences of the crisis and the brutal recession and then i think it will be much more difficult to to remain popular and also for hung uh, for orban in hungary orban's popularity right now is practically on the same level than it was before which is about 45 50 percent of the electorate uh, the active one which is pretty high but i don't think they will be able to keep up this high level because uh, they have to deal with the economic crisis and one reason why Fidesz could remain so popular since practically 2012 uh, is that they they uh, went through a, a period of very strong economic growth so I think illiberals in power will suffer a lot in the next period but I have to say that democrats in power in other countries will suffer a lot as well and then these countries pop, uh, populism can uh, can be on the rise what is the what is the um, what is the relationship between uh, the Hungarian public opinion and the European Union still we can see interestingly that there is an overwhelming support towards the public opinion but I think this is the paradox we can see in Poland as well uh, in two countries uh, in Central Eastern Europe where the anti-EU rhetoric is the is is the loudest uh, the support for the public opinion uh, towards the European Union is still rather high. On the other hand, I think we should not downplay it as a, a, 
as a consequence, as, as a non-existing danger. Of course, most of the citizens in these countries do not want to leave the European Union because they know it comes with a lot of benefits. On the other hand, if you scratch the surface, this kind of victim identity, I think, is very strong in, ver in a lot of Central Eastern European countries. We are secondary level citizens of the European Union. We are just the colonies of German companies. The Western countries are treating us unfairly. And, and as it happened in the past, we are again just, you know, the toys of superpowers. So um, populist politicians uh, in both in, in Hungary, in Poland, and I think in Czech Republic as well, are quite happy to exploit this kind of sentiments. And you cannot always see them in the public opinion polls. So, so Eurobarometer polls are important, but I think they are insufficient to get a, a real picture on the, on the narratives on the European Union that are, um, are quite different among Eurosceptics in Eastern Europe than in Western Europe, because here the, the narrative is much more that the West treats us unfairly, while in the West it's, it's much more about, yeah, we are better than most of the uh, EU member states. So it's, there is, I think, a qualitative uh, difference. Now I ask the second oral question, also a colleague of us, Andreas, he is an expert on disinformation for sure. Could you, uh, oh, he has left, okay. Well, then uh, he hasn't had, the, um, then the former uh, MEP from Hungary, uh, Benedict, would you like to unmute yourself and we will unmute yourself as well and then you can speak to us and raise your question. Yes, hello everybody. Okay, and perfect. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, just one short remark and two interrelated questions. Uh, the remark uh, is that um, um, it's not only the phenomenon, but Peter was explaining how the Hungarians or the uh, government uh, supporters feel about the EU, but this crisis is used by the government to further undermine um, um, the credibility of the EU, saying that the EU is not helping it. This was mentioned by, by the other speakers as well, that the government of communication very often concentrates on saying that we, are, we get support from Russia and from China and, and everywhere else, but not from the EU, no money, no other help. So uh, regarding how the public see the EU, I think that uh, the crisis might have uh, an important effect. We will check it, of course, just months after the crisis is over, but uh, I, I wouldn't underestimate uh, the possible strengths of this, uh, this effect. The question um, is um, um, basically that how do you see um, the risks of the fight against uh, fake news? Uh, keeping in mind that uh, in the uh, virus emergency law in Hungary, the amendment of the criminal law uh, says that uh, journalists spreading false information, fake news could be taken to court. Um, and um, in this context, uh, fake news is used uh, to, um, um, to menace, to threat, uh, threaten uh, the journalists themselves. Uh, so if the EU comes to Hungary saying that we cannot accept what's going on in Hungary, the Hungarian government may say that, come on, you are telling us to fight against uh, fake news. We are doing that. And now you say that uh, that it's it's uh, not accepted by uh, by the EU. And uh, uh, the related next question to that, that how do you see um, uh, the action of the EU regarding the anti-democratic developments in some of the member states uh, under the shadow of this whole uh, corona crisis. Because what I see that uh, partly because of those uh, elements, the EU is simply uh, cannot react on uh, uh, those developments in, in Hungary, but also in Poland. Uh, they Partly they are uh, measureless, they don't know what to do. Secondly, they do not have the time, the energy, the sources, attention, anything to really to step up. Uh, and thirdly, what they do sometimes, it's even worse in the situation. If you just check the recent interview with, uh, with Vera Jourova, 
O2 that there is nothing wrong with the Hungarian virus emergency law and it's not against uh, uh, EU law. It's it's really just backing Orban and, and making the life of the opposition very difficult in, in Hungary. And uh, the recovery package, economic package, uh, which was developed by the, uh, by the EU, um, which is a, in a way it's a kind of helicopter money. Uh, they just give a huge amount of money to the member states and everything is given to the hands of the, the member state uh, governments. This again uh, strengthens much more uh, the populistic governments than um, it fight against them. So it's, it's quite a complex question, sorry for being long, but that's that's my question, that how do you see the risks of, of uh, the fight against uh, fake news and false information, how um, populistic governments misuse um, uh, this, uh, this thing and how do you evaluate uh, or assess the EU's reaction uh, on the um, undemocratic uh, developments in, in some of the member states? Well, who would like to, uh, Mikolaj, would you answer first and then Peter and then Agata? What, I mean, you, you nod your head, especially when it came to the question of the fake news. Um, if you actively can prove that you fight the fake news uh, as the Hungarian, try, Hungarian government tries to do, what are you going to say as a European commissioner? If I may add a few sentences to the start from the, from the end. Uh, you mentioned Vera Jourova. Uh, just a few facts. She's Czech and she's former vice chair of ANO party, that's the party of Andrei Babish, the Czech prime minister. And that's the prime minister who owns company Agrofert, and that's the company which has a branch in Hungary, a big one. I think a lot of subsidies uh, flowing through Hungarian uh, subsidy uh, or from the EU uh, to Hungary. So do not expect her to be too much uh, vocally or aggressive against Hungary. This is the first thing. Uh, second thing regarding the uh, the fight against the uh, fake news, yeah, it backfires quite a lot. Uh, what we have like uh, established a system uh, is a sort of like system or pressure to really like uh, filtrate uh, information, let's say in social media or even the classical media which is sort of like, or we expected that to uh, be used to stop the, the fake news, which are uh, targeting the EU. On the other hand, no one was really uh, thinking about how to ensure that this system will not be used by the local governments in order to uh, filtrate information that could be crucial for the local opposition. We simply gave up the, freedom of information to some sort of robots and we now expect them to really like treat us properly but like I think it's not really good idea to uh, delegate the decisions about our freedom of speech to artificial intelligence or uh, judges uh, in corrupted states. It's simply, uh, it should be simply uh, rather uphold than, than restricted. Uh, yeah and now we now we face the crisis, uh, which is being used in various states to really expand the the powers of local authoritarians. The same stories we have seen from uh, in Hungary, it's in, in many other countries. Uh, I, I, could, I can mention Czechia, where the government was trying to prepare a law to empower prime minister with with further further uh, like powers. Uh, on the other hand, we have seen similar uh, development in Moldova, uh, in some other countries of Eastern Partnership. This is really dangerous. So that's why it's really better to rather try to avoid censorship and provide better communication rather than try to block the communication of someone else because the authoritarians, they are quite good in spreading propaganda. Who would be next to like to answer? Agata, you want to comment on this? Uh, okay, I would like to say something on uh, media and uh, mm, and disinformation and fact checking. And uh, I would like to go back to what Peter said that this uh, disinformation coming from inside 
is uh, extremely important. Uh, and um, now in Poland, the most popular uh, TV program is the state-owned uh, TV first channel, uh, which uh, in my point of view is spreading a lot of disinformation and also is uh, providing this uh, campaign against EU. And the problem is also that uh, the state-owned media uh, were supported by a huge, a lot of money uh, at the beginning of this year. Uh, two, uh, two billion zloty were transferred to state-owned media at the beginning of this year. There, there was a huge political debate uh, around this and finally the president signed the bill and the money which these days uh, yesterday or two days ago were transferred and uh, of course it is a huge support for uh, uh, mostly to the public television uh, and uh, in times uh, when uh, private media are losing advertisements uh, because business is cutting their budgets uh, this money from the state budget uh, mean a lot to uh, to this state-owned media in Poland, uh, and uh, and people watch it, and uh, uh, and mostly these media are watched by people in small uh, villages, small towns uh, uh, to the east of Poland. Uh, of course, in the regions where the support uh, for Law and Justice Party is uh, huge. Uh, and the problem with fact-checking and delivering the reliable information is that uh, we do not have access to these people uh, because uh, a lot of these people do not uh, use internet so oftenly, they just watch TV. Uh, and uh, on TV they have access only to the information provided by the state. And this is very often uh, disinformation, not information. Uh, and this is the problem. We, we like to be honest, we don't know how to uh, how to cope with this problem uh, because we, uh, as fact-checking medium, we very often uh, have the impression that we talk to the people who who we know and uh, who are. Uh, quite then, well informed, uh, who use information, use different uh, sources of information, and uh, uh, yeah, and the problem is how to cross this border, how to reach to, to those people really disinformed. Uh, I don't know, maybe EU could uh, uh, have its program in Polish state-owned television <laughs> or something. Um, I don't know. Uh, and to, to the to the threats uh, in, in Poland, uh, this government is threatening us, the journalists, that they are going to introduce the bill on fake news uh, and uh, that they will be uh, cutting the licenses to the journalists, etc., etc. But uh, so far it is a threat. Uh, this kind of bill was never um, in the parliament. Uh, we don't know the, uh, the details uh, of uh, this supposed bill. Uh, so, so far it is only a threat. I see. Well, the question of how to communicate out of our own bubbles, I mean, this is a continuous uh, question I think we are all raising permanently and maybe we, in our last round we can speak about this. Before I give the floor to Peter, I will add one more question from a Czech uh, colleague from Göttingen, Lubomir. He asked a question to Peter Kreko, just to understand one detail on how the government works, was the Iranian student you have mentioned really sick or was he just blamed for being a foreigner and therefore a potential threat? Yeah, thank you. I, I would start with this with the second one. Uh, yeah, these, these Iranian students were tested as coronavirus positive. But uh, the interesting thing uh, 
with with that was was uh, they were uh, mentioned by the pro governmental uh, speakers and even the propaganda by you know Iranians just hanging around here in Hungary. In fact, they were uh, they were students studying in Budapest uh, with a state scholarship of the Hungarian state. So by Hungarian taxpayer money, uh, they are invited and and so far the iranian hungarian relations i have to say were rather good but in this case of course um, orban and the government uh, found the opportunity to blame it all on them and there were some stories about there were some lost iranian students from central european university who is also busy in spreading the uh, coronavirus so they abused this situation to to spread fake news but as far as we know uh, they were tested corona positive so it was not the problem but the way how the government communicated about them and then the way how they uh, they um the in paid advertisements the government told to the hungarian people that we expel the ill behaving the ver the bad behaving uh iranian students as, as a big big success so it was really um, ugly i cannot really tell um, anything else in this regard but um, this was not the only case when the government in the last period uh, was fueling hatred and the pro-governmental uh, media about some politicians or journalists. Coming that, back to Benedek's question and just seconding Mikulas and, and Agata, yes, I, I think it's, it's a big problem that some governments and, and the gov Hungarian government is in the front line, want to use the fight against fake news as a pretext to crash down to crack down on the on the independent media what happened in hungary as as benedek told is that there was a uh, uh, there was a criminal code uh, restriction that allows the courts to put people in for five years in jail for spreading hoaxes false news or distorted uh, information on on the coronavirus and it's, I would say it's like a sword of Democles that is hanging above the head of the journalists. And if the journalists would not understand the message in itself, there are pro-governmental think tanks, government finance think tanks and um, governmental outlets who are listing the people who they think are spreading fake news. And I think we can already feel on the Hungarian journalists that they became a bit more cautious and it's totally, uh, totally understandable. No one wants to go in jail for five years because of this law. But there were there have been already two cases and not journalists where this uh, under this new uh, possible legal opportunity, the the uh, there was there were some sues against citizens, but it's really a sword of 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 democrats. And it's not just only um, only journalists who are depicted like spread uh, ones who are spreading fake news. And, and are being the enemies of the state, but also politicians. What happened only yesterday is that one of the members of the parliament from the same party where, where, Benedek, um, uh, where Benedek is coming from, Dialogue for Hungary, she stood up at the parliament and questioned the government on why there is a shortage of masks in Hungary. Uh, and as a result of that, today's pro-governmental media labeled him as an insect that is spreading bacteria all around Hungary. So it's, uh, sorry to say that, I don't say that the Hungarian government uh, is, is, can be labeled as such, but this is Nazi language. This is Nazi language used by the primary pro-governmental uh, um, daily, and no one on the governmental side said that, sorry, this is something disgusting, sorry, this is something we, we cannot allow. So this, this radicalization, of the of the public discourse in Hungary has rather accelerated uh, by this um, coronavirus. Could you also maybe uh, we have heard last week in our cluster about the situation in hospitals. So obviously the government is uh, base uh, is locating military representatives. Uh, towards hospitals. I mean, and also the fake news uh, so-called law is, as you said, not just addressed uh, to silence up a journalist and ordinary citizen, but also obviously doctors who were constantly complaining about the, as you has mentioned in, in your input, uh, the, the weak uh, and the poor situation in the hospitals. 
and also I guess this uh, will have an influence on the situation how doctors will speak up um, on the on the health and medical situation. How would you see this? Yeah, I, I would just agree. I think that everyone became a bit more cautious as a result of this this law, and and uh, I, I really do think that that. Uh, Agreeing with Agatha, uh, probably it will be not something that will be used immediately, and especially if the international uh, international attention prevails. And that's coming back to Agatha's point again. That's why international attention is very important. As far as the government will feel that there would be too high costs of of using this law extensively, I think they will refrain from that. But on the other hand, uh, ordinary citizens would feel that okay, probably five years in prison, it, it doesn't worth it that I, I criticize the government. And yeah, a lot of doctors who have problems uh, might be silent um, because of that. And yeah, I've, I've heard some cases already. So it's not only a message to, to journalists, it's, it's a message to, to everyone. And it's an authoritarian message. And just one uh, day before, or one day after this law was passed, in Russia, there was a similar legislation passed through the Duma that makes it possible to put people in prison for five years for spreading hoaxes. And we could see it in Azerbaijan, in Armenia, and in a lot of uh, countries in the post-Soviet space that they like this kind of approach as well. So it's it's really coming from the authoritarian playbook, as, as Mikulash also told. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There's one more question from, from Germany. In Germany, we observe that uh, more people look and seek for qualified, serious information in normal times. Does this kind of trend exist also in Central and Eastern uh, European societies? Mikolas Agata, what would you respond or answer to this? Who would like to reply? Ladies first. Agata, do you want to? Is there okay. a trend? I mean, you're three million, uh, not subscribers, but at least readers and ready yes. to crowdfind, yeah. ready to crowdfind um, almost 20 people of stuff. I think this is an amazing effort. So there is obviously a niche for this. Uh, yes, we are like, proud of this and, and we observe this uh, definitely. And also in the last weeks, uh, we can see like uh, really uh, peak in our readership, uh, which is of course great. And uh, uh, we also know that uh, many media in Poland, uh, media which uh, uh, produce uh, reliable information. Uh, they also are watched or listened or uh, read more oftenly by by people, and uh, this is yeah, this is very positive and optimistic. But uh, on the other hand, uh, there is this this second uh, uh, spread of uh, disinformation, which is uh, really. Um, also, uh, like we uh, every week we have a kind of a report uh, on social media on what was uh, dominant disinformation this week. And for example, last week in Poland, it was uh, about Chernobyl. Uh, I don't know if it, it was the case in uh, other countries, but in Poland uh, there was a lot of disinformation uh, on this, that uh, the, the cloud from Chernobyl is com coming to Poland and uh, uh, warnings to people that uh, they better not uh, leave uh, home, not only because of coronavirus, but also uh, because of pollution uh, coming from uh, Chernobyl. And uh, it was fake, of course. Uh, but uh, we also observe that people are so scared that uh, they better believe this. Like they feel more safety if they believe uh, worse uh, information. Uh, so I would say that uh, the situation, this crisis uh, creates the space for both uh, uh, checked uh, uh, information, but also because of this fear uh, to to a lot of 
fake and uh, a lot of uh, disinformation. Yeah, conspiracy theory are just high in numbers. And even we have heard from the German Secret Service, I guess, last night uh, that there's a, an increasing amount of conspiracy, especially in the right wing um, uh, areas or right wing circle. Um, and and uh, so there is worrying in tendency, even in the state's institution, that we have to do something, but nobody knows. I guess how to really tackle this issue. But coming also, back, to, the oh, problem yeah, is that, uh, that uh, now we have a lot of new users, daily users of internet and of information. Many people uh, started using internet so oftenly they didn't do it before, and they are not prepared. Uh, like, uh, for example, in Poland, uh, a lot of teachers. Uh, it may be surprising, but they were not using social media and uh, so often before. And now they are new users of internet, and they are completely unprepared to uh, to deal with conspiracy theories and uh, to fake news. So, for example, I I would say that uh, teachers would be this group to target them with tools how to. Uh, cope with uh, information from the from the internet. Nikolas, how we make out of illiterate uh, digital uh, users, literal uh, middle uh, media users in, in terms of social media, what would be your guess and how is the situation in the Czech Republic? Is there a growing number for serious and, and fact-checked uh, media? Yeah, I would say there is one. The problem is that the situation or the, the stage is more structured. Like one thing uh, every politician has to learn is that uh, different medias are being read by different group of readers. And uh, the problem is that usually those authoritarians like Babish, Orban, Kaczynski, they do not uh, do not build up their voter base. Uh, on the people who uh, seek for uh, this type of journalistic. They uh, rather uh, do in quite like a simple approach, take the big tabloids or something like that and spread their propaganda to the people who read them. Uh, so that, that's the problem that uh, the people who seek for, let's say, fact-checking, uh, uh, they uh, do not tend to support the governments. However, it does not help because in the democracy, you need to build up a majority. And a part of that, uh, well, uh, improving liter uh, computer literacy is something that we really need to work on. And I am maybe curious on the, uh, the information from my colleagues because there is a specific phenomena, which I am not, not sure whether it's specific for Czech Republic, but we observe it quite often. And that are chain emails uh, spreading uh, between, let's say, senior people. Uh, the, let's, the, the older generation is quite like uh, able to use the internet. On the other hand, the most preferred tool uh, is uh, the uh, is the uh, email, and uh, hence we see that uh, there are a lot of uh, fake news being spread just from uh, one to another person uh, sent it by email, effectively uncontrolled, unobserved, but uh, very much affecting the perception, especially of the EU or uh, this corona crisis, uh, how it works. And uh, well, we should, uh, I think we should more uh, try to communicate with them. I've never seen any sort of like, uh, emails uh, targeting on this particular community uh, from, let's say, government or uh, sources that would be quite like useful. Okay, before I completely wrap up, we have 90 minutes now and uh, since I do not see any more questions, I would like to ask you, if you like, um, to give a final statement, a final comment, or Agatha has already told us some, let's say, advice or some um, recommendation for the European Union. I really like this 
standards of leadership and when then uh, Benedict was uh, quoting Mrs. Jurova, she was pretty happy with the situation in Hungary. I mean, this is exactly the opposite of uh, what uh, your recommendation sounds like. So I see there's a lot of uh, things which we have to improve and where we can work on. And we spoke about uh, EU Stratcom, we spoke about the expectation now in this crisis, what the EU could do, and actually we do a lot, but uh, the Commission uh, was very late and very little um, in, in terms of communication, so people do not see the visibility of, of the assistance, and this is, I guess, one of the main problems. And of course, uh, the Kremlin has a very professional, highly let's say, targeted uh, a propaganda set up for the last six years. And it is really, really hard. As Agata has said, they get 15 likes, 15,000 likes, and we get five from the EU Commission for uh, explaining how the assistance works. So there's a big, uh, let's say, asymmetry and disbalance uh, in, in communicating. And I wish we could also hire some of the professional uh, PR people from Russia who explained to the Commission how to run uh, uh, fake news, but in, in, in a good sense, not uh, I don't want to be misunderstood, but just in, in, in terms of the how are you going to reach the people and the groups you have just mentioned, the citizen, the senior citizens and also some younger groups. I mean, we are all communicating in our bubbles, but nevertheless, the propaganda is much more effective on uh, on targeting uh, the, the certain groups and why it is so difficult for us to 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 reach them and um, this is still it's a phenomenon for me and and why we are so weak on this. Anybody would like to make a final statement from your side uh, before we say goodbye to all our audience and uh, to everyone else? Peter, is there anything you would like to mention or to... Yeah, ju just very briefly a few things I, I wanted to mention and haven't mentioned so far, pretty much in line with what has already been said. I think regarding the lack of communication, there are uh, representations of the European Commission and the European Parliament in every member states. So in countries where there's a huge, massive and uh, propaganda and, and the fake news campaign against the European Union, they should be more vocal. They should enter into um, enter into debates. They should be more political. I think without without uh, with a very bureaucratic approach, uh, bureaucrats will never uh, never persuade any any uh, any citizens against the populists. So this this asymmetry should should reduce somehow. Also, the pressure coming from the member states, from the European Parliament, and sometimes from the Commission, even if it's really ambivalent, I, I think it should be kept up because, uh, as I, it's not true, I think neither for the Polish, ni neither nor for the Hungarian government, that they do not listen to international criticism. They do listen, and they really like like to uh, go a fine path between what is acceptable and what is not. But but attention and, and pressure matters and and as a, as a last constructive thought uh, Germany yeah is taking over the presidency of the of the European Council I think it's it's extremely important to keep rule of law issues on the agenda and the conditionality the conditionality of EU funding to rule of law issues because this is something that that would really uh, that is the most crucial for for authoritarians and illiberals. They understand the language of power. They understand the language of money. They do not always understand the language of of sub diplomacy. Very good. No, that's for sure. They understand the, the language of money and business. Uh, Agata, anything from your side to? Uh, yeah, maybe I would uh, build on what Peter said that uh, communication is important and PR is important, but uh, actions are what uh, speak the loudest. Are, the actions are the most important. Uh, and uh, people, uh, like, I feel like uh, here in Poland, people expect something from Europe these days. Uh, people know Europe because of uh, what we got from Europe. People uh, 
the, this support in Poland is so high for Europe because of uh, open borders uh, and uh, because, of course, of the money uh, were given to Poland uh, and because people can see the buildings built by European money in almost uh, every village in Poland or roads or uh, or other institutions or uh, and uh, I think that I, I believe that uh, these days something coming directly from Europe like for example Polish government is supporting mostly uh, business and mostly owners uh, of uh, companies uh, in their pro anti-crisis programs and people who are losing jobs these days they are uh, left alone uh, there are no money for them planned in this anti-crisis plan plans so far uh, so some support from europe uh, coming directly to people uh, like money people can say this money came to me from Europe. This would be a like this would be something which would uh, build this trust for European Union for for years. I believe. No, that's for sure. The social questions are the key questions, and that's why peace gained so much uh, support during the last years because they have. Um, managed to somehow um, send the transfer, the social transfer, and, and especially in the rural areas. And you're right, especially now, the self-employed people, you have talked about the media representatives, and they are the most affected now by the crisis, and they should see and feel uh, the support of the European Union. Absolutely right. Mikulas, anything from your side to the final summarize? It is somehow hard not to repeat from what uh, what my colleagues previously mentioned, but uh, I, I will not I will not uh, end up pirating myself. I think uh, the communications at the end responsibility of uh, every single citizen, as it is much more decentralized in our times. So I think at the end of the day, everyone has to do the fact checking. Everyone has to control what he or she is sharing. Uh, what is communicating farther and what not. And nowadays, uh, the authoritarian governments, they quite often use uh, psychological techniques to, to force you to spread their message. But uh, I think it, it's always better to spread positive messages about what's, uh, what's good rather than spreading the fake news and uh, bad news in general. And well, like, uh, a part of spreading. I think it is also very good to know how the journalists uh, live. Uh, nowadays, it's not really something uh, a profession uh, where people would enjoy high salaries and some somehow uh, huge uh, job benefits. Is quite often underpaid. So when there is a medium, you can support uh, well. It's good, it's good to support because uh, the media quite often like rely on uh, they, they rely on their readers, especially the independent media. They they really need to be read. Uh, quite uh, if there is if there is an opportunity for a subscription for uh, such a server, do it if you have the uh, if if you have the chance. Uh, when they kind of like sell advertisement, it's not an offense, it's a way how to finance the medium. So uh, think about it, whether to block it or not, because it can be helpful, especially for, for the independents. It's maybe some, some things which sh should be repeated from the time to time. Very good. Very good pirate. Uh final statement and you're absolutely right. Um, I, I always go in the same direction and, and when you were saying the positive news, I think this is something what we as politicians always try to communicate, but uh, as I said, it's always not, uh, it's uh, almost not as successful as the other ones. Um, I, I liked uh, the idea of, of course, uh, keeping up the pressure and the German presidency, the upcoming German presidency from the 1st of July has a lot of responsibility when it comes to Central uh, uh, European states. As you said, uh, Peter, it is the keeping up the, the rule of law uh, mechanism 
Um, I know they are very concerned about uh, critics coming from uh, us as parliamentarians, coming from different member states. I know they are vain. I know they want, don't want to be criticized. They like uh, having a clean reputation in, in all over Europe. And Mikolas and I, we will work on more conditionality on EU funds for sure. It's not as easy as everyone thinks. That's a big problem because the, all the regulation and the financial interest of the European Union is a very vague, um, let's say, description or definition. But this is in our very much uh, in our interest uh, to change this regulation so we can really cut some funds and hold them back and pass them around to the local level, to the NGOs, to think tanks, to alternative sources uh, for the people themselves, rather than on national uh, agencies. So I have taken a lot of notes. Uh, we will work on them. Thanks a lot um, to my guests, to my speakers, but also to all the audience who contributed via the um, written and oral question. Thanks everyone who helped to organize this webinar. And I hope we do not see each other for the last time. I'm pretty sure we'll stay in contact with the audience through different channels. Thank you. Have a nice evening and hope to see you again very soon. And for today, I say goodbye to everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. And thanks for, thanks for organizing it. See you soon. Bye bye.